Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Siebke Dierling, and I'm the Turbulence PDT lead here at NCAR. Um, and I'll be following Jason talking about one of the underlying products that he was mentioning in his talk beforehand, the Graphical Turbulence Guidance Nowcast product. Um, for this product, the science lead and the brain behind it is Julia Pearson, who's I think also online. Uh, the lead engineer is um, Jason Craig, and then also Bob Sharman and Greg Mamer is on the, are on the product team. So to start out with just a brief overview of the Nowcast product. Um, so we have two products. We have actually a turbulence forecast product and this Nowcast product. And the turbulence Nowcast product is meant to be a tactical um, aid to to avoid turbulence in the short term, it has rapid update rates every 15 minutes, and it is valid for the next 15 minutes. The current GDGN system, which is the name that it's called, um, is using as input a short-term turbulence forecast from that forecast system called GDG. And operationally right now, it is um, using, or the first version of it, I should say, is using the GDG3 output. Um, and uh, the most recent one or two hour forecast output from, from it that is valid um, closest to the now cast valid time. And it then takes the most recent observations to nudge that short term forecast uh, from GDG. So it uses currently um, airborne observations of turbulence, PIREPS, and uh, in situ EDR data from aircraft, as well as radar-derived turbulence from the ground-based NEXRAD radars. And in the future, we're looking at the next version of GTGN, which will use other data such as lightning data, um, potentially also satellite information, and other airborne information that might get ingested into GTGN. Uh, GDGN, the Nowcast, is um, produ producing one uh, turbulence Nowcast output, but it, uh, it basically um, comprises all sources of turbulence. So that means low-level turbulence, clear air turbulence, mountain wave turbulence, and also in and near cloud turbulence. The output of GDGN is a 3D grid over con the continental United States currently. Um, and it's a 3D grid of eddy dissipation rate, which for you for um, you that are not familiar with um, eddy dissipation rate, it's an atmospheric metric of turbulence. It's independent of the aircraft. So one can relate that independent turbulence metric to an, uh, the reaction that a, a large or, or small aircraft has by converting it. And um, we've done studies in the past um, comparing pilot reports with EDRs to see how those translate to how an EDR translates to larger aircraft 747s that react a little different to turbulence than a smaller aircraft 737. So just to back up a little bit and see how this forecast and outcast system works, this is a architectural uh, picture of it. It starts out with uh, the forecast, short-term forecast uh, production of GDG. So currently uh, the input of GDG is NOAA's wrap uh, model output um, that then um, gets input into, into the algorithm of GDG and produces a forecast um, for one hour out to however long the wrap for a few hours uh, runs. Um, so we pick the first one or two hours that are closest to the now cast time and that are available at that time, and then merge that short-term forecast with the in-situ reports and pilot reports, as well as with the uh, um, in-cloud turbulence information that's derived from the NEXRED radars, basically, and, and we have a whole composite for that. And um, so then that grid can be made available to users. And in the future, um, we are now doing development to incorporate other sources such as lightning data, satellite observations, and other airborne information um, that could be ingested into GTGN. 
to give a little bit more information about the inputs into GTGN. So first of all, um, we have the short-term forecast from the graphical turbulence guidance product. So this is model a model-based turbulence forecast uh, product um, that can be input or used on various models. So they include NOAA RAPS model um, that's currently running operationally at NOAA. Also the global GFS model that's uh, FE3-based, which is also currently running operationally at NOAA. Uh, GDG has been adapted to other types of models, the UK global UK Met Office model, uh, French Arpege model. And in the future, we are currently in the process of adapting it to um, the Rufus, uh, NOAA's new Rufus model, which um, is, you know, has a smaller grid spacing than the RAP, 13 kilometers horizontal grid spacing of the RAP. The Rufus will have three kilometer grid spacing like the HER and is the predecessor for, for the CONUS forecast product from, from NOAA. So currently for the version, first version of GDGN, um, it, we input, as I said, the short-term GDG forecast based on NOAA's RAP model and uh, output an EDR grid. Um, the idea behind turbulence forecasts using model, uh, operational models that are available is that um, um, we assume linkage between uh, larger scale sources that that uh, produce turbulence and link that to aircraft scale turbulence, which is not currently resolved by any of the operational models. So the scales of turbulence that are important for aircraft are more in the hundreds of meters um, and the grid spacing of a model right now of an operational model is more three kilometers um, or in the kilometer range and up. So we have to come up with um, something that um, will be working on these operational models. And assuming a linkage between turbulence sources and the aircraft scale turbulence through turbulence cascade is quite reasonable and works, works quite well. So we do that, that's the idea behind GDG. So now um, for the current GDG that is implemented, um, uh, we compute a suite of turbulence diagnostics that are representative for mountain wave turbulence, for clear turbulence and for low level turbulence. And then um, in the near future, um, we'll upgrade actually with the Rufus upgrade uh, to include um, the convectively induced turbulence in clouds as well. And then um, the output of GTG is a 3D mosaic of combined turbulence. So, whoops, um, mountain wave turbulence and CAD, as well as those categories separately. For GTGN, we take the combined output of mountain wave and clear turbulence that's predicted by GTG. Um, and uh, the uh, grid spacing is um, 13 kilometer horizontal grid spacing and 1000 feet in the vertical. So that is the, the one input into GTGN, the Nowcast product. The next one is um, the radar information that I mentioned. Um, so we have an algorithm called the NCONX Red Turbulence Detection Algorithm, which makes use of radar information, actually the spectrum width measurements of Doppler radars, um, which represent the variability of radial velocities inside clouds. So they are linked to turbulence. Um, so NTDA uh, converts these spectrum width radar measurements into eddy dissipation rate. Um, and um, then NTDA also combines um, the EDR uh, estimates from all the different next red radars to one CONUS composite. And uh, that is input into uh, GDGN as well. Um, so here, this shows actually an example of, of NTDA output on the right. This is a vertical cross section through a convective storm, convective cores with high radar activity on the left. And then um, you can see the anvil and stratiform region on the right. On top is the, horizontal, the vertical cross section of EDR. So the pink colors here are actually extreme turbulence, really high EDR values um, in the core. Uh, note that they don't um, you know, resemble exactly the radar reflectivity. Highest turbulence is really on top of the cloud. Um, and some in the core, but then you note also that when you go into the anvil where flights might try to go through if there isn't any room, um, 
uh, there is also pockets of light and also moderate or greater turbulence, uh, which it's hard to see here, but um, are more the yellow colors um, or, or lighter colors. So um, the radar information has the advantage of picking pretty quickly growing, you know, turbulent cells with, with the clouds with turbulence um, up and uh, providing a high update rate, five minute update rate. Um, at pretty high um, temp uh, spatial resolution to two kilometers and 3,000 feet vertical resolution. Uh, this product has also been verified with in situ measurements and PIREPS. Um, an example is shown here, so down, down on the bottom. Um, and um, so, so that is one uh, observational input into the current GDGN1 system. The other observational input that we input into GGGN um, are PIREPS. Um, PIREPS are subjective, they are aircraft dependent. Um, they include time uh, of the report and position, but have some uncertainty because sometimes a pilot might not get the time to put in a uh, turbulence report right when it happens. Um, so they come with some uncertainty. There's not that many of them, um, but we use those with um, a window of uncertainty to ingest them into GDGN. And then we in, in, use also the in-situ EDR reports on planes, which I think Greg Mamers is going to talk about a little later, um, which are automated aircraft independent measurements of turbulence um, that have high accuracy in terms of space and time. And um, so we, there are a lot more, it's, it's really good information um, for an outcast system and that gets ingested into GDGN as well. So one example shown of the GDGN product is, is here uh, from a couple of years back. Um, this is, was actually a convective line that you can see on the NTDA radar information here that went through and behind that line, there was um, a lot of, turbulence that was also reported by in situ reports and pyreps. Um, so just an example of the how the GDGN nowcast looks like. Um, this is the GDG3 two hour forecast, which is one of the ingredients going into the nowcast. You can see um, there's actually a pretty good prediction for that short term forecast of that turbulence occurring behind that convection. Um, but it does not actually uh, resolve the convection itself very much because for the GDG3 product, we don't um, have include SID yet. We will for the GDG4 product that is coming online in the future um, with the Rufus model. Um, then we include NTDA, which has the most accurate information about the convection and in cloud turbulence. And then also um, added are the in situ reports and the PIREPS, which then uh, result into a pretty good com as a complete picture of the turbulence now cast and overlaying observations uh, of that now cast that's valid at 16 UTC observations are for the next 15 minutes. We see that that does a pretty good job in, in uh, now casting the turbulence. Another example um, was this case um, last year in February, and this shows um, you know, a line of smaller, moderate, um, a line, yeah, moderate turbulence. Whoops, um, for 15-minute increments. So starting at 16:45, flight level 370. 15 minutes later, then in the middle, and then 17:15, uh, 30 minutes later on the right. And you can see that overlaid are again observations from PIREPS and in situ measurements um, 15 minutes from the valid time out. You can see that GDGN um, captures this line of moderate and greater turbulence pretty well. It also captures the null turbulence around it pretty well um, from, for, these developing, for this developing system every 15 minutes um, out. And then just uh, for the same case, this shows um, just the GDGN now cost for different flight levels, starting at flight level 300, 340, and 370, just to illustrate again, um, and the observations are overlaid again on top, and uh, just illustrating again, changing behavior of turbulence with height that's now casted and verifies pretty well. 
So GDGN, um, under the guidance of Tammy Flo at the FAA, has undergone a safety review and a technical review. And as part of that, we have also statistically evaluated it. Um, this shows uh, for summer and winter months, respectively, um, the probability of false alarms for moderate or greater turbulence on the x-axis. And then on the left-hand side, the probability of detection of moderate or greater turbulence on the y-axis. So ideally, if you, everything would be now casting completely accurate, you'd end up um, basically in the left-hand corner here. Um, so this shows just the comparison between a short-term forecast of GDG, the performance, and then a, a short-term now cast of GDGN. And you can see that GDGN with the additional observational information scores better. The, the better, um, the, the larger the curve to that one, you know, to the left, the better the results really. So you can see that GDGN scores better than the short-term GDG forecasts for particularly the summer, but also the winter time. As part of the GGN1 evaluation, um, also um, the FAA coordinated an evaluation from Delta Airlines using this pr product in the cockpit. Um, so what's shown here is the G GDGN display um, via an app that uh, Delta Airline pilots took and uh, used as guidance. And the feedback was um, quite, quite well um, received. Um, so, so moving ahead, we are now um, looking into um, making additional um, adaptations to and, and enhancements to DTGN. We are um, on the research side looking at adding um, lightning data, for example, as well as, as satellite data, as I, as I said earlier. Um, lightning information um, has uh, in the past shown to be quite useful and correlate with in-cloud turbulence. Storm electrification um, has been shown to correlate well to storm or is associated with storm kinematics. Um, and uh, a variety of research that we have done in the past um, has given us some uh, platform to, to develop um, capabilities to infer turbulence from, from this lightning data. So uh, we show here, you know, where, where radar data is not available. Um, this lightning data might prove to be valuable. Um, on the uh, upper panels here, we show the Inner Mountain West where we have next right radar coverage that is not complete. So we have gaps there. Uh, lightning data is filling in these gaps. So on the left-hand side, we are showing GDGN1 with just radar data on the right-hand side. We're showing it with additional lightning information you can see that it fills in um, particularly moderate or greater turbulence spots that might not be completely seen by the radar because they might be there's terrain there, uh, which lightning detection systems are not so prone to. Um, so in this case, there was moderate in situ reports of moderate or greater turbulence um, that were not captured by the radar uh, on the left hand side over the Inner Mountain West, but then when lightning was included, they were captured. Um, and the same is also true where you don't have lightning data in coastal regions um, uh, or over oceans, it might help include as a fill in where radar doesn't see much. We are also uh, currently working on incorporating higher resolution GDG short term forecasts into GDGN uh, based on her and, and um, in the near future, the Rufus model. Um, so that is at higher resolution three, with three kilometer grid spacing. Um, and it will also include a convectively induced turbulence forecast. Um, another benefit is uh, going to smaller, resu higher resolution um, is that the NTDA information, which comes at higher resolution of two kilometers, um, will be incorporated at uh, that higher resolution of three kilometer domain as well, um, more to you know, its native resolution, which is an advantage. Um, so you can see here um, on the right-hand side, just an example of GTGN based on the 13 kilometer grid that's um, using GTG input from based on the wrap. And on the right-hand side, GTGN based on um, the HER 
Um, so you can see quite a bit more fine structure here um, based on the HER. So in summary, um, DDGN is a tactical turbulence avoidance aid um, for aviation. Um, and it is, has been funded for um, several years by the FAA. Um, it identifies, it's a 3D product, it identifies uh, turbulent layers for uh, flight level, individual flight levels um, every 15 minutes for a 50 minute time duration, um, ingesting turbulence observations and those short term forecasts. Turbulence forecasts, um, the cases that I've shown show that GTGN was able to pinpoint specific regions of moderate or greater turbulence and also um, null areas of turbulence, also areas of null turbulence. Um, it has the first version of GDGN, GD Engine 1 has um, undergone a, uh, a technical review and a safety review um, guided by the FAA. Um, and currently the FAA is funding GDGN 1 um, to be run somewhere operationally through at NCAR and its output is available through an LDM feed um, uh, so that, uh, that data can be obtained um, with a no cost license. Um, at the, I actually put the web address um, to request it here. Um, the second version of GDGN is under development and um, you know, to, to look where GDGN is going, um, the NTSB has recently published a recommendation to operationalize um, the turbulence now costs. Um, it's planned to uh, transition it to NOAA and set for operations, but it's also available to, to other customers uh, if that's of interest. And with that, thank you very much and um, happy to for, open for questions. Thanks, Vipika, for, for going through that. Um, awesome product, use it all the time at Delta. I did have a question. I'll start with the underlying assumption that comes from my observation of it. You talked a lot about, and I understand the focus on it as a turbulence uh, safety mitigation. But we've actually seen a ton of value from the identifying the null areas. And it appears that you take kind of your, your best guess. And if you had a bunch of null reports, the the Nowcast is smart enough to string together null EDR reports and kind of carve a channel through the best guess so you can see smooth air. Am I correct that it does that? Yeah, it doesn't take into account um, the null reports and also interpolated nulls between um, the regular, yes, so. Um, How long does it wait to collapse that back down? What, you know, it, it seems, you know, flight goes through and it kind of carves that channel out of, of null or smooth. How long would it consider the null reports valid? That's a good question. And I think Julia is actually online here. I don't remember the, the exact time window it does that. Um, so she might be able to put that in the chat <laughs> for, for you to That answer. was really my question. <laughs> yeah, but it is for, um, yeah, I think 20 minutes, yeah. I don't, I think she knows the correct answer. So maybe it's, it's best for an to... hour. Beepco. Okay. Thank you. An hour. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Sort of spinning off this a little further of Matt, Matt, what you said. I mean, the GTGN, the now cast portion, the observations are really overriding the underlying GTG forecast. So where there are differences, there is information contained in it. There is intelligence that the model didn't quite get it right and the observations are overriding it. Right. To what extent could that intelligence be utilized to help the model up to speed through smart data simulation? And you may not know the answer, but That's a good I'm question. thinking there, there could be value. Um, I don't know the answer, but that's a good question on it might be good to think about and how that could go back to the model in terms of, because it's, it's in clear, it'll be also in convection, which it's a challenge just by itself, but um, that would be interesting to. You would need to understand what the reason is, what kind of turbulence out. mechanism did the model right. not get and then be smart in terms of helping it out to speed. Yeah, that's right.
Randy. <laughs> so, so to so to Matt's point, you know, th that drives the fact that a no pie rep is useful, and you know we don't get enough of those. But we also know pie reps are terrible. And it's a, that's a whole different <laughs> issue. Um, but I believe soon we're going to be talking about ADSB turbulence, and and I think that would really help. Um, Problem with that is probably too much information. We might have to throttle it down somehow. Um, See the one thing I wanted to mention, though, was right now the plan is to transition GTG in into National Weather Service, but it's probably going to be at least 2024, maybe 2025 before that happens. Um, we're seriously considering, I've already uh, contacted Tammy Flo about this, of doing a similar uh, tech transition uh, industry day later this summer, uh, similar to what we're doing here with Romeo, because I, th I think this is another uh, capability that could very well go to industry and, and run just as, just as well as the weather service. Thanks, Randy, for that comment, yeah. Okay. more comment or, or feedback, because um, you talked about development of GTGN2. Mm -hmm. I think one thing um, that I've learned from interacting with pilots that have been using it now for a few years is that um, it's somewhat confusing to them, or it's not clear to them that the NowCast co-mingles high confidence and low confidence information. And those are kind of my words, because I'm not a meteorologist or a research meteorologist at all. So it seems you take, you know, like a pilot report and an in situ report, especially right after it was captured as high confidence. And then you, where you lack information, you know, and you're really interpolating or just pulling out of the GTG3 for a best guess is low confidence information, but the confidence is not delivered to the end user. And that's useful actually to them. I think it's difficult. Um, and we've tried to give them the perspective of, hey, you know, it carves out these channels. And so that's a place you could probably be confident in because it was an actual right. observation. And TDA is really, you know, it's observational-ish. And for them to try and pick out things that are more patterns where it's doing a best guess, but that's difficult for them to pick out as a human. That may be something to consider in, in the future to maybe provide in the underlying data. Um, it still needs to be deterministic, I think is the, the term, but maybe a, a confidence would be really helpful for them to weigh, um, you know, actioning off of it. That's actually, that's great feedback. And uh, to me, that goes back to Matthias's question too, because we have the observations, maybe there's some way of teasing out and, and we input the model, maybe there's some way to tease out based on the observations, confidences on how confident we are currently in the model output input. And then that can go into, you know, the confidences that one might have in that input. Um, so, yeah, that's great feedback. Thanks.